Chapter 31, our last chapter of the of the class. Uh, congratulations on getting through 17 chapters. Okay, Confronting Global and National Dilemmas, this is part one, uh, 1989 to the present. So we're going to go from the late 80s, the end of the Reagan administration, to our present day in, in this chapter. Okay, So gl confronting global and national dilemmas brings up this word, globalization. So this is somewhat of a new word on the canvas of history. What does it mean? According to your book, the spread of political, cultural, and economic influences and connections among countries, businesses, and individuals around the world through trade, immigration, and communication. So around the world is key there. The globalization is the ability to trade and interact with people all around the world because technology has allowed us to do so. We can communicate better. We can reach out better. And it's not so close as it used to be so the world is a smaller place and i don't mean you know uh the size of it technically but figuratively it's easier to to deal with countries that 30 years ago were just too far away all all because of technology okay go ahead and watch the first film here for this class watch the film globalization one the upside crash course world history number 41 go ahead and watch that film come on back <clears throat> So globalization is a relatively new term used to describe a very old process. It's an historical process that began when humans ventured out of Africa to spread all around the globe. Uh, I said a long time ago that the history of the world, the history of human beings, is, is it parallels the history of trade. So going, going back from the very beginning when humans emanate out from Africa, they did that because they wanted to improve their lives, they want to interact with people, but they also want to exchange goods and ideas. So in, in doing that, many times conflicts arise over ideologies regarding trade. And you have wars. So wars don't come out of nowhere. It usually is about trade or some kind of power struggle about trade. Trade's a huge part of history, but perhaps the the most uh dominant uh you know idea in history is 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 how how humans and different countries and so on deal with trade and how they interact with trade so this is where history begins is trade uh so that's what globalization means today it's about international trade so it truly even though it's kind of a new idea it's a continuation of an ages old behavior between humans so over these thousands of years distance has largely been overcome and human-made barriers have been lowered or removed and we're able to facilitate the exchange of goods and ideas much easier than we used to. It's all helped along by technology. In today's times, email, websites, cell phones, the Internet, all these things, you know, uh, have resulted in the, in the interconnectedness and interdependence that people have. And this has grown. You have the increasing integration of the world or globalization. Uh, now, this idea has enriched life, but it's also created some new problems. We talked about homogenation before, uh, where people start to become the same, where you lose your cultural identity. So in international trade, the big players in, in that trade tend to exert their influence. It means more sales. So this is why you have McDonald's in the far reaches of Asia that, you, you know, 20 years ago, you, you wouldn't think you'd see, but now you see it everywhere. America has left its fingerprint all over the world. It's about trade. And people that are of those countries see that and start, start to become more like America and they lose their identities. So the smaller players want to be like the big players. <clears throat> they take on their characteristics as individuals, but also as countries. <clears throat> the result is a reduction in culture and it makes us all become more the same. So the end of the Cold War changed the global environment of the world used to be the United States versus Soviet Union, these, these two countries that were very opposite, capitalism versus communism, and, and the politics of the world in the Cold War era what were shaped by what these two were up to. But post-Cold War, it's a different landscape, and Asia and Europe have exerted themselves and have become players in the world's economic economics and politics and trade. 1992. Uh, the EU or European Union was formed to create a single state. Uh, you know, it's it's easier in numbers to to trade and 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 have agreements and and 
facilitate new agreements that make you <clears throat> make you more money. Uh, you, you, you come together as 28 European countries in economic and political union. Uh, of course, this covers covers most of the European continent. <clears throat> so the idea began in the aftermath of World War II to create economic cooperation. And the idea was that countries that trade with one another become economically interdependent and they're more likely to avoid conflict. <clears throat> so of course, what's that sound like? Or, or, or whose idea was that? This is Woodrow Wilson in 1918, the League of Nations, and they voted him down uh, because we're never, never going to have a war like that, but they did. So after World War II, the United Nations and these types of things become popular. So the EU is definitely influenced by the United Nations and the lack of the League of Nations after World War I. But interestingly, you have a situation called Brexit today in the EU. What does Brexit mean? Well, it means Britain and exit. If you put Britain and exit together, you get Brexit. Britain, the United Kingdom, is trying to leave the EU. They, they want to be on their own. Uh, they, they feel like uh, they, have a, they, they have a better opportunity uh, on their own to become an independent Entity. They have more op they have more abilities and opportunities that way. They 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 want to leave. They they want to determine their own laws and their own future. This has created a bit of a turmoil in the EU and world world um, economy. Uh, this is this is this is very similar to what America did post World War One. Remember, they wanted to go back home, be isolationists. We don't want to be in the League of Nations. We we want to be free to do our own foreign policy. We want to have our own our own trade agreements. We don't want to be um, associated with 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 uh, with Europe. So, very similar idea, but of course, different time. This is happening right now. Please watch the next film, Brexit 101: The UK's EU Referendum Explained. But understand this: this this film's a couple of years old. Things have changed a little bit from what this film says. But this is this is the 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 idea of where this idea started. Okay. Okay, so as we speak, Britain is leaving the EU. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what will happen. Uh, I mentioned China. China's become a major player in world economics. They, in fact, China has agreed a higher economic growth than the United States in the 21st century. This causes the United States jobs, uh, even though America continues to buy Chinese products in a, in a huge way. So we talked about Walmart before and, and why. Our Walmart's products so cheap, and we learned that it's because they pay cheap labor in poorer countries than we would have to here. And this brings up the idea, this modern uh, idea or or issue of minimum wage. Should we raise the minimum wage? And it, it is being ra raised as the minimum wage increases, and it's proposed to reach fifteen dollars per hour in California. Uh, Overseas labor will become more attractive to manufacturers, okay? Uh, so if you own a company, and let's say you're a clothing company and you have a, a sewing room and you have 100 people sewing every day, but you have to pay them $15 an hour for an eight-hour day. Uh, so what is that, $120 a day? So you're paying them $120 a day times 100 people, okay? And that's what you have to do, do in the United States because – United States workers are protected by a minimum wage. An employer can't oppress you like a slave or a sharecropper. I, I, I should say modern-day sharecropping really works out to be much less than minimum wage, but um, that's kind of a loophole. But typically, the typical American worker is protected by minimum wage. You can't pay me less than that. Um, so, but you're – you have the option as that business owner to go to a, a, a another country somewhere and pay those hundred people ten dollars a day, not fifteen dollars an hour times eight hours, one hundred twenty dollars. So instead of instead of one person making one hundred twenty dollars, one person makes ten, okay, times hundred people. You, you begin to see that the math it makes perfect sense. It's good business sense to go somewhere else. So a higher minimum wage can very well result in less jobs in America because, because uh, <clears throat> manufacturing and business goes where the, where the uh, labor is cheaper. You can get away with, with cheap labor that's, that's 
you know, below poverty level in some cases in, in foreign countries. There, there's no regulation there. So that's uh, that's the other side of this. So minimum wage is interesting. People think it's about kids and teenagers. <clears throat> you know, why do we have to raise minimum wage for them? They, they work part time after school. They live with their parents taken care of. They don't need the money. Uh, they, it's just extra spending money for them. Um, is is that something that we need? But that's not the way that it is. What's the reality on the right side? The average age person that's that's earning minimum wage is 35 years old. 88% of people earning minimum wage are not teens. They're 20 or older. 36% are 40 or older. 36%. 56% are women. 28% have children. 55% work full time. On average, they earn half of their of the nation's. I'm sorry. The, I'll, I'll I'll get it. On average, they earn half of their family's total income. So many people, older people, are working jobs that are minimum wage. Why is that? Because since the Depression of 2008, and we'll talk about that when we get there in this chapter. Jobs have changed. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you hear a lot, and Obama started it, uh, talking about all the all the Tens of thousands of new jobs, and Donald Trump continues with it. But what are those jobs? Those jobs are not full-time, full-benefit jobs like people want. They are part-time jobs. So, you know, 10,000 part-time jobs is not the same as 10,000 full-time jobs. It's much different. So an older person may have to work three jobs to get by. So I'm going to give you an example of a friend of mine, a woman, uh, who was a cable TV installer for many years and was very good top-notch installer, could handle the job, and everything was fun, but then she got older. She, she turned 50, and she got laid off because they were concerned about her ability to continue a physical job because she's older. Uh, so where did she go? She, she she can't go to a satellite TV company or cable company because they're not going to hire her either, even though she's experienced, she's, she's older. So what do you do? Well, she, she got a job at, at a supermarket. She does Uber. Uh, she does whatever she can to get by. She's got three jobs uh, to try to come near. She can't quite make it, but come near what she used to make. She's got no benefits anymore. You have to pay for those because these new jobs that the, that the two presidents are, are talking about don't offer benefits. They don't offer full time. It's less than 40 hours. If you work less than 40 hours, you don't have to have benefits. The company doesn't have to pay you. So companies have learned that if we give people jobs between 30 and 35 hours a week at minimum wage, they'll take them and we don't have to give them anything, any any kind of benefits. Okay. So this is the this is the true state of our of our modern workforce. So every time you hear about all these new jobs, look closer. What are they? Are they full time, full benefit jobs? Not very often. Okay. <clears throat> so it's not about kids. It's about real life people out there trying to support themselves and support their family. Okay, please watch the film entitled Should the Minimum Wage Be Raised? This is a, this is probably one of the more popular films that I show. This is pretty interesting, uh, pretty funny. Please watch that and then come on back. <clears throat> so how do you feel about that? I mean, that's, that, it's a little frightening because technology is great. We all love our cell phones and we love our abilities and things that we do. <clears throat> but what about when technology takes our job, you know, a bank teller used to be a pretty decent career. Uh, you go into a bank today, my the bank, um, my bank I go into, it used to be five tellers. Uh, now it's four machines and one teller. <clears throat> what happened to those four people? They're they're working in another bank that will sooner or later become the same and they're going to be out. So bank tellers becoming a kind of a job of the past. What about a Order taker at McDonald's or, or Burger King, as the, as the film mentioned, they're being replaced by kiosks. You can go up and touch screen it and you don't need people. What happens to those people? They're, they're out in the streets. They might go to Burger King, but Burger King will have a kiosk soon enough. So it's interesting. Technology is great, but it's also taking our jobs, artificial intelligence, robotics, mechanics, uh, technology. It's uh, it's yin, the yin the yang, right? It, it's great, but it's bad. It's, it's taking our jobs. It's and the minimum wage is is forcing companies to go overseas. Uh, so interesting. All these things are are, are present day dilemmas that that we all should be aware of and, and understand and and look at. And 
and uh, you know try to figure out what's the best course for you uh, as college students. You know, and I'm not going to name uh, uh, majors, but some you know some uh, majors might be obsolete. So be be careful about what you what you're spending all your time and money on doing. You know, you can still get a college degree, but perhaps look into this and look to the future. And is this skill going to be needed? In my lifetime, for, for for what I do, I'm doing an online class right now. Well, what what's to stop the the entire country from saying, well, let's just let's just standardize all these courses. We're going to have one person record all these lectures, and that and we'll just give them to all the schools. And that's a possibility as long as it meets the standards. It doesn't matter if it's me or somebody else. But I and most of my colleagues will lose lose our jobs. Okay, uh, so it's a very real situation that the progress in the future doesn't always e uh, equal uh, prosperity and progress for people, okay? Okay, um, moving to more politics or national economies, staying with this idea of globalization. So you got the group of eight, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, UK, USA. So the group of eight, initially began as an organization of capitalist countries that included Russia, that alone tells us how much the world economic environment has changed. Uh, however, because uh, uh, Russia decided to annex uh, Crimea, they have been kicked out of the group of eight, now it's group of seven. And of course, Russia's trying to get back in, but as we speak, not, not yet. <clears throat> so the group of eight, is a powerful group of these powerful countries that control the world's economy. Understand what I just said, control the world's economy. It's not a free trade, it's not free, they control it uh, through the World Bank, through the International Monetary Fund, we, we talk about all these things, through the general agreement on, on tariffs and trade. Uh, so globalization also means consol consolidating countries for advantage and power. And that's what the group of eight is, or the group of seven, I should say. Isn't that a modern international form of monopoly? You can't really argue that, that against that. What would Teddy Roosevelt think, the trust buster, the man against monopolies? Uh, what is NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, started by Bill Clinton? This is a trade agreement between Mexico, United States, and Canada, of course, neighbors, North America. Uh, instead of having trade restrictions, let's come together and make it easy to trade with each other. So it 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 reduced barriers that were holding these three countries back from trading. Okay, uh, this of course is a point of contention for Donald Trump. He feels that this is an awful agreement. He wants to abolish it. Okay, uh, so you're talking about. America, as an example, but all countries becoming global, not just national. So America, American corporations have, have a global address today. They are not national corporations. They're multinational corporations. They're international corporations. Most uh, corporations today are all international. You, you, you can't not be and compete, okay? So the end of the Cold War, has also opened new opportunities for trade worldwide. The deregulation of financial institutions and markets have allowed a free market to flourish. Uh, it's not free trade, but it's been lots of barriers have been knocked down, and and uh, this has created uh, you know a, a a booming market. So spectacular profits have resulted. Consumerism is worldwide now. The product of the Western world. So we, we've talked about consumerism from the very beginning of this class. If you go back into the class before the Civil War, American history class before the Civil War, same thing. You have different eras where, where something happens to create opportunity. People buy more goods. The Industrial Revolution in this class. Mechanization, mass production, factories reduce the prices of things. So people, people that couldn't afford them before are now buying them. Uh, the 1920s was a consumer decade, the 1950s, post-war 60s, but, and it continues today. We, we are a consumer-oriented uh, country, and it's a consumer-oriented world. This is a product of the Western world. Uh, un understand what I'm talking about here. Consumerism means you're consuming things, and many times 
it's all because a very slick advertising campaign talked you into believing that you had to have that thing. We, we don't need 90% of these things, but we, we all buy them because we want to keep up with, with society and culture. We, we want to be cool. We want to be seen as fashionable. We want to be seen as, you know, progressive. So we're buying, 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 going into debt, and they're getting rich, and we're getting in debt, okay? Understand understand that, that, that all this – all these things, all these brands and trades, it's all about them making money, okay? I'm not trying to suggest you shouldn't buy anything. I don't mean that. But just be aware of what you're doing, that you're spending your hard-earned money to make them rich. And now you've got another pair of shoes that you don't really need, okay? And it costs you $90. It probably costs them five or, or less to, to make. It's all about the brand and the and the uh you know, uh, the feeling that you get by wearing the statement you make by wearing these shoes. Is that real? It's really not. Okay. Um, okay. So, so technology, as, as we all know, exploded as the new millennium approached and beyond. So, so many of you were, were born in, in the new millennium or, or just you, around there. So perhaps you don't understand this, but in the 2000s, the, not the 90s, it, it absolutely exploded, and it, and the world changed in a completely different way. Uh, we're communicating in ways that were never imagined. The World Wide Web, www, uh, it was was opened in 1991 to the public. It had always been around, but opened to the public in 1991, and this revolutionized nearly every aspect of people's lives. Even today, we we can't survive without being on the internet every day <clears throat> you have pcs and cell phones and camera phones and all these things that change the way we live this happens in our era 1990s uh maybe it was 15 years ago or so uh, i remember <clears throat> i remember the first time someone texted me a picture i didn't even know what it was <clears throat> i get a text i i look at it open it and here's this click on this. I'm like, what is that? And it's an image of my friend, and she was at a baseball game in Seattle. Hi, here I am in Seattle. It was live. I, and she sent me the picture. I couldn't believe my eyes. Like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? Of course, we do it every day today. Uh, maybe maybe some of us a hundred times. Uh, you know, uh, texting pictures is not a big deal, but understand what kind of revolution it created, because now it's changed sales completely. You can you can videotape. You can you can take pictures with your phone, and you have them right now. You don't have to wait for film to be developed. You can you can go to the store for your mother or father or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, and they say, "I want this product." When you get to the store, there's three different ones. Which one do they want? You take a picture, boom, text it to them. They send back. Pick the one in the middle. It's changed the way we do things completely. Uh, so technology, I remember a TV ad um, maybe uh, 20 years ago where the screen, you look at the screen and it's, a, it's an advertisement, it's, it's a commercial, and it's a split screen. On the, on the left side, you see L.A., on the right side, New York, and, and it's people in an office. And they're all you know, kind of upset and freaking out a little bit. The people in, in L.A. are saying by phone to people in New York, we got to have that contract, that document right now, like right now, or we don't get our deal. Our deal will follow through. The people in New York said the best I can do is overnight it to you one day. Of course, that's that's pretty amazing technology too, right? That was a breakthrough of epic proportions. You can send something across the country in one day. It's amazing. So back to our commercial. So the people in New York say we can we can um, mail it to you in in overnight that's not that's not fast enough okay but, but a man in new york says that guys i got it under control just give me the document and let me take care of it and he takes the document and he puts it into something you can't see it but the document goes from the new york side of the screen to the la side of the screen and the people in la get the document and they're ecstatic they're happy they're jubilant it's a fax machine it was the most amazing thing that that you'd ever seen in in those days in, in my time, 20 years ago, it was like, oh, my gosh, like, how do they do that? How this is going to change the entire world. This, the world will never be the same. Of course, today, fax machines are obsolete. We don't even use them anymore. But this that's that's how technology is. It, it pops up. It's amazing. Then it's gone. OK. Um, there was a, there was a uh, 
the, the uh, I'm sorry, the, the idea of cell phones, and we all have cell phones. We carry them around everywhere we go. But when they when they first started, they weren't cell phones. They were car phones. Um, well, I mean, they still were cell phones, but they they stayed in your car. They were part of your car. Uh, they were attached to your car. You, you didn't walk around with it. So that was the first, you know, ability to actually talk on the phone away from a landline in your house. It was hardwired. <clears throat> Slowly, they morphed into cell phones that you could carry around with you. This was amazing. Like, oh my gosh, he's saying I can walk around with this phone. I, I can, I can go down the street and go upstairs, and I can do whatever I want with this phone. I can use the phone. I don't, I don't have to be in my car. No, this was amazing. And I remember the first time I, I, I used one. My, my first cell phone, you know, I owned a business in L.A. It was a construction type of business. And I had different job sites. And in the past, if I wanted to talk to a foreman, I would have to page him. Of course, there's another technology that was, that was tremendous in those days, paging somebody. Um, I would page him 911, and he knew that he needed to call me right away. So whatever he was doing, he had to drop what he was doing. If, if on that job if there, was a, there was a telephone, then great. But if not, he had to drive and find a payphone, a telephone booth. Remember those? Probably most of you don't. There were phones everywhere. You can put money in it and, and make a phone call. We don't need them now. We all have cell phones. Anyway, he would have to go and find a telephone booth to call me or, or vice versa. If he's 911 in me, I have to go and, and, and find one to call him. But it was great because we, we knew we had to talk. But it was a pain. Well, now the now the cell phones come out of your car, and my first cell phone was was about a foot long. I'm not even kidding. I had a I had a little holster on my hip. It would go almost down to my mid thigh. It was a huge huge thing and banging around, but it was amazing. And I remember my first time calling my foreman Larry from my from a six story roof on a job site. I just picked up the phone and called him. He said hello. I'm like, whoa, this was amazing. <clears throat> of course, now we have these little tiny phones, and you know we have all these things that we can do with them. Um, all, all kinds of cool stuff. So, so technology is moving at a pace that's never been seen before. You can't keep up with it. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about technology had outpaced tactics in the Civil War. That's why it was so. There were so many casualties that that the old the old military uh, field strategies were were archaic compared to the weapons. The weapons were wiping people out. Uh, this happens. A streaking technology. Uh, Will that have an adverse effect on society? I mean, we'll we'll see. We don't know. Uh, I think that there it's possible for that to happen. Uh, politics and religion is is a very very big issue in our lives today. Re religions kind of become politicized. You have the arguments against religion and secularity. Uh, it's somewhat become a, a culture war between these two. <clears throat> continues to be a struggle in modern America. Uh, so religion typically coincides with conservatism and secularity with liberals. So Republicans and Democrats, same as ever was, right? Uh, and an entire, an entire century and a half has gone by. <clears throat> America is still about Republicans versus Democrats. Same issues, big government versus small government, civil rights versus self-determination. Uh, but we live in a multicultural world today. It's changed. It's changed dramatically in my lifetime, dramatically. America is no longer defined as a white European-based people. So slowly and painfully at times, it's changed. So today, America is not a single type of people to be integrated with or Americanized. It's not a place yet to come to and become like them, like the immigrants of the turn of the 20th century did, or the Native Americans in the 19th century. It's a, it's not that. It's a diverse collection of many different types of people who have entered the mainstream to have their shot at the American pie. <clears throat> it's different eth ethnicities living and working together. This does not always make everybody happy, as we see in our streets every day. So, it, so, th so these things are complicated. And it's hard to find in, in mixing cultures and multiculturalism. Is it is it a is it an easy thing or a hard thing? You know, I, I always condone the idea of instead of trying to figure out why they're so diff why people are different and having a problem with that, or again, ethnocentrism, if they're not like me, I don't want to be around you. Look at look at how they're different and celebrate those differences and enjoy the difference. That's what interaction of people is, right? Okay, let's uh 
let's go to our next film. This film has a little bit different perspective on culture. Please watch the film, Are Some Cultures Better Than Others? And then come on back. Okay, so that's an interesting idea. Um, but vehicles to level the playing field, we talked about affirmative action. Remember affirmative action uh, where you give uh, uh, formerly marginalized groups access to employment and education, and then it was accused of reverse discrimination. You're hiring, um, you know, underqualified people over over white people. Uh, those vehicles were intended to level the playing field for the marginalized groups, but they were scrapped uh, in California. That the passing of Proposition 209 put an end to affirmative action. Okay. Uh, in our country today, immigration is still seen as an evil. But wasn't America built on immigration? I mean, truly, who's an immigrant in this country? Everybody, unless you have a lineage back to Native Americans. But you can argue that they're immigrants also. They came over from Asia across the Bering Strait. Uh, I, I think that that's probably going back too far. But if you're not a Native American, you're an immigrant in this country, especially since the 1600s when this country started, the colonies anyway. You know, everybody that came was an immigrant. There was no native people here except for the ones that were here, and they were pushed out and, and died of disease, okay? So immigration is still an evil to a lot of people. This is a quote from a Republican candidate, Patrick Buchanan, running for the presidency in 1992, so nearly 20 years ago. And he says that America is undergoing the greatest invasion in, in its history. Who's he referring to? The the migration of millions of illegal aliens a year from Mexico. So let me ask you, are these people truly illegal? Do they wake up in the morning and say, we're going we're to tunnel under, under that wall because we want to break the law? No, they're not doing it to be illegal. They're not criminals because, they, because they're breaking the law. They're breaking the law, that's American law, because they want opportunity and they want their kids to be safe and they want their kids to go to school. They want medical care. They, they want the things that we have in America. They're not getting in Mexico, cartels, corrupt government. They're not safe. Women being abused, uh, children with no, no chance for a future except for crime. They, they want to get their families here and hopefully get their piece of the American pie. So they're not trying to be illegal. They're, they're trying to just be free. And that's what America's about, isn't it? Um, that's what America's about. It's about freedom and equality. That's what it started as. Are we that way today? Are we still that way today? At the turn of the 20th century, the immigrants coming through Ellis Island in New York City became legendary, proud moment in American history. Both, both sets of my grandparents came through Ellis Island. So that's where, where you know, how I got here, okay? Ellis Island, what else is in New York City Harbor? The Statue of Liberty. Of course, that's the that's the beacon of freedom. When the when the immigrants see the Statue of Liberty, they cry and then they, they know that they've arrived in the land of the free. This is a hundred or more years ago. Uh, and what it says at the Statue of Liberty, a little plaque, it says, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. So you're tired, your poor, your huddled masses. It doesn't sound like we're that they're asking for the best people. Uh, President Trump recently asked Mexico, why do you send us all these people? Send us your doctors, your lawyers, and your business people. We don't want – send us your best, not your not your worst. But that goes against American uh, policy or ideology uh, completely. Uh, he doesn't know it's history because that's not what America was based on. If you look to the right, the great late comic Robin Williams says, the Statue of Liberty is no longer the same. Give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses. She's got a baseball bat and yelling, you want a piece of me. So is that who we are now? And is that who we want to be? It's that bold, arrogant American, the, the ugly American idea. Is that who, is that who we want to be? <clears throat> so this plaque and this this uh, this uh, heading here, give me your Taji poor, your, your huddled masses. This is part of a, of a poem entitled The New Colossus, written by Emma Lazarus in 1883. This was, this was to commemorate the Statue of Liberty that was erected in at, in the late 19th century. So this poem is on this plaque here. So I'm not going to ask you to read the plaque. I'm going to give it to you like this, okay? So I'm going to read it first, then we'll go over it line, line for line to, to dissect it and figure out what, what this means. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea watch, sunset gates shall stand, 
a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that Twin Cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she. With silent lips, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So that's pretty inspiring, and that's pretty uh, uh, welcoming. And and what what what's it saying? Come one, come all. That's what America is, a land of opportunity and freedom. You can come as nothing, become something. <clears throat> so, so let's just look at this a little closer. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs that drive from land to land. This is not some... Greek Adonis, Greek God, uh, you know, Hercules. This is just a simple woman, a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, her name, mother of exile. So what is an exile? An exile is a person that's been kicked out of somewhere. So if you're an exile of a country, you got to go somewhere else. So where do you go? Statue of Liberty was the mother of exiles. Give me your exiles. Come here. That's what she's saying. From her beacon hand. Blows worldwide welcome all around the world. We're not looking at different at, at one specific type of people. It's worldwide. Her mild eyes command the air bridge harbor that Twin Cities frame. Talking about New York City Harbor. Twin Cities in that day was New York City and Brooklyn. Keep ancient lands your story pomp, cried she. So what what she means by pomp, it's it's that that European tradition of hierarchy and monarchy and kings and lords and oppression and feudalism and the serfs and the peasants and the and the you know the the very elite have all the money that's 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 their story pomp keep that that's not who we are that's not who america is with silent lips and then it gets pretty serious here give me your tired your poor your huddled masses yearning to breathe free now that's that's America right there, but it gets even even uh, more in depth here. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. So what is refuse? Well, there's a word refuse and there's a word refuse. Two different words spelled the same. Refuse means trash. So wretched means you know like the the worst awful refuse. Give give us your the, the worst trash you have. And send them here. Send the homeless here. Tempest toss. I will lift my lamp beside the golden door. So she's saying she's not saying, send me your doctors, your lawyers, your businessmen, your wealthy billionaires. No, she's saying send me your worst because that's where America came from. Yeah, that's where it started. Yeah, I'm talking about the United States and the colonies. Of course, the natives were here long before that, but the the country that came to the United States started from. People that didn't want to be in Europe, they came here as indentured servants to work to try to better themselves. Okay, uh, so there you go. That's that's uh, how's that make you feel? It's pretty inspiring. But is that who we are today? I, I would think that most people would say no, and most people would happily say no, or a lot of people would say happily say no. So so what's different? Well, we have a president, and I'm not putting it all on Donald Trump, but misunderstand me. This has been going on for a long time, but he has definitely increased the, the pressure on this. Trump and his immigration plan deport all 11 million illegal immigrants. So illegal immigrants, what does that mean? It means people that came here uh, illegally, but they come here and they have a family. They have a life. Many are here for generations. Many are here for you know years and years, and their children grow up here. Uh, you're talking about just one day disrupting that family and sending them back to a country that's very dangerous. You know, Mexico is a little bit out of control today. Lots of violence going on down there. Um, is that is that the American way? Now, I get it. If they're illegal and you want to be, you know, letter to the law, you want to follow the law, okay. But but is that the approach we need to take, or can we come up with a different approach? Is there some other other way besides just kicking them out? And we've seen the families at the border, uh, kids separated from their mothers. You know, it's awful what's going on. Uh, ICE, you know, is is it, it many times has been compared to Hitler's uh, 
SS troopers, you know, uh, storm troopers just beating people up, bashing people. Is is that who we are? Is that who we are now? Is that are we happy with America being like that? These are questions that are being asked today. Trump wants to end birthright citizenship. Of course, if you are a pregnant Mexican woman and you cross the border illegally, but your child's born here, that child's now a citizen with the rights of the American citizen. He wants to end that. He wants to triple agents at the border. Uh, triple. So I don't know if you've been down. There's a whole lot of them down there now. I don't know if, if we need that many more. Uh, perhaps we do. Um, he wants to build this border wall. He wants to build it higher. Well, I mean, I, I don't think that people are climbing over it so much. Um, they get around it some way or another, and they probably will continue to. So it's probably a huge amount of money not very well spent. Uh, perhaps we can use that money coming up with a solution that works for everybody. Okay, because that's what it's about. Wretched refuse, uh, huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That's who these people are. They're not illegal. They want to breathe free like we do. We fight wars for that. So that they they want to be part of that. They're not illegal. Just people looking for a better, a better, uh, you know, uh, life. Okay. So Im so immigration of Mexicans and Middle Easterns under Donald Trump's administration is looked down upon, while the immigration of Europeans is not. So is that a thing about color? Are we looking to add more white people to the country, but not Non-white people, is that what this is about? So as America progresses into a new millennium, it can look back on huge progresses of, uh, in civil rights, human rights, can't deny that. But the old haunting scepter of racism is still there. We're still working on a problem that has existed in American history for 400 years. 400 years, and America still deals with the issue of the color of a person's skin in modern society. Has politics embraced this problem? Well, the election of 2016 that, that brought Trump to, to, the, to the rise was a very contentious election. Was race an issue in the campaign? Absolutely it was. Uh, is race an issue in American society today? Absolutely it is. We, we see it every single day. Uh, there's riots in the street. The George, uh, George Floyd incident has brought it to the forefront again. It, it never seems to go away, but it's never because it's never solved. Okay. Uh, so conservatism was popular throughout the last 30 years of the 20th century. We talked about family values. We talked about the mixing of religion and politics. Before I get away from that, I, I, I missed the slide. This is kind of funny. Uh, the man in the middle that's pointing at the family is the typical white American male. He's pointing at, at a Hispanic family uh, that, that are illegal. And he's saying it's time to reclaim America for, from illegal immigrants. And, of course, the real Native American says, I'll help you back because you're not uh, legal here either as far as I'm concerned. You, you also came here as an immigrant. Okay. Um, so back to the side. Conservatism, family values, should politics have a say in these types of subjects? Uh, should religion be part of the political process? And religion and politics and religion becomes politicized. And, and candidates use it as a way to get votes. And conservative family value candidates push that they are Christians and they, uh, they pray to God and, and they always say, God bless America when the, when the, uh, when the speech is done. And, and I'm, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. If you believe that, that's perfectly fine. Express yourself and 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 do that. But but religion is supposed to be separate from politics in this country. Otherwise, you'd have a state religion. State religions oppress people and kill people. So we don't want that. We want freedom of religion. So a, a candidate that's pushing you to believe he's Christian is doing the opposite. He's 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 not about freedom. Okay. So this is a this is a a very volatile question that, that, that's going on in, in our modern times. And subjects like birth control, abortion, homosexuality, gay marriage, these are all dis divisive subjects that, that, that we have in this new millennium. And it still boils down to Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, liberals, religion versus secularity. And we have this, this kind of seemingly never-ending argument. Okay, this has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, and we still have this. 
They're all things that are happening in our modern day, okay? Okay, that is the end of part one of chapter 31. Uh, please uh, go on to part two of chapter 31. Thank you.